I'm Joanna Garzilli. You're watching Life Stories. Today, my special guest is Craig Shoemaker, Comedian of the Year, Emmy winner, and founder of Laughter Heals. Craig, welcome to Life Just Stories. Just your accent is why I'm here. To hear my name said like that, which is, you said the, even Craig, most people in this country say Craig. I don't know where they get that from. Like it's an egg. It's Craig, like you said. Craig. And I love the Shoemaker instead of Schumacher. That's what people, oh, Craig Schumacher, my favorite comedian. I go, no, it's Shoemaker. You make shoes, you don't mock shoes. <laughs> Unless they're Crocs. Those you can mock. <laughs> I love it. Well, I will be saying your name throughout our time thank, thank together. Craig Craig, Craig. 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 Should I say your name like you would? Instead of Joanna. The, the, Joanna. In Philly, I go, hey, Joanna, how you doing? <laughs> Is that where you're from? From, from Philadelphia? Philadelphia, Joanna. I, how was that? What does I, do? what I like it, Joanna. You know what I do when I go to England, though? I have to do an impression of like a celebrity who's from England. I can't just do the English accent. Like years ago, I used to do. Do you know who James Mason is? Yes, of course I. Do. Oh my gosh, yeah. James Mason, hello, Johanna. Lolita, I'm here to do your nails. Hello. I love it. <laughs> Wasn't he in Thunderbirds? Or was that Thunderbirds? He Thunder, Thunderbirds? I don't know, but he was in Heaven Can Wait. Was one of my oh my favorites. gosh, one of my favorite with one. You'll Beatty. never be. You'll never be Joe Pendleton ever again. Oh, I got goosebumps. Look oh, at that. I love so James good. Mason. Those I, I used to do impressions. David Niven. David Niven, all of those, all of those English actors, I could do them. Peter O'Toole. Oh, Stone, take me to that place you call Brooklyn, and we'll dine with rookie Kai Roka, lost in the 15th round, Madison Square Garden. Ooh. Nobody even knows what I'm doing. I mean, it, it, and Sir John it, Gielgud. That's the pro I could do all the old English actors, and that's why I don't do impressions anymore. People go, who in the hell is that? You know, uh, like I do uh, Patrick Stewart. You know, he oh, is. Oh, of course. Well, I do him as Captain Picard. But now I have to tell he's the kids, the he's the X-Men wheelchair guy. Yes. I know him as make it so number one. When Engage. Did you, <laughs> when did you start doing impressions, accents? Did that start off in childhood yes. for you? Yes, when I, st I started by wanting to be someone else. Why did you want to be someone else? I didn't like who I was, so I wanted to be someone else. So I did hundreds of impressions. I do impressions of... You know, the local flower town guy, Hank, you know, he'd walk around. You think my face is any thinner since the last time I saw you? Do you think I'm more mature? And I would do Hank, and everybody knew Hank in my area. I always said if Hank was famous, I'd be famous. I did a good Hank, Hank Walton. But, I mean, I, I wanted to be somebody else besides me. What was your neighborhood like where you grew up? Brothers, sisters? I, I grew up in uh, Philadelphia in the city on the corner of Crack and Homeless. It was a beautiful place. <laughs> but, uh, Sounds delightful. But, well, they were row homes. Have you ever heard of a row home? Is that sort of like town homes lined up next They're to each They're all lined other? up next to one another. And uh, the landlord didn't like it that I built a tunnel over to Carl Rodswich's house. <laughs> and I covered it with an Elvis Presley poster. <laughs> So if I want to go see Carl, did you do Elvis Presley impressions? I, back oh then? yeah, oh yeah. I, I did everybody. I'd have posters of the people I do impressions of, but they all die, so that I don't do impressions anymore in my act. And so, were you studious at school? No, no. I was not studious. I was the uh, I was the class clown, literally. I was also very short. And my high school, I won the shortest in the school. I was five foot one. And they posed me next to a six foot five guy just to humiliate me even more. And the guy, I did not win wittiest. Paul de Blasey won. And it always bothered me. And then he came to my show at the Hollywood Improv one night. He's a teacher now in L.A. And I said, who's the funny one now, Paul? <laughs> so I finally got even. But, uh, yeah, I was a, you know, a big geek in high school. And uh, I'm six two now. But I still think. So like you went that through guy. a suddenly a growth spurt. What, oh yeah, I still have uh, I still <laughs> giant lumps from growing too fast called Osgood Schlatter's disease. I grew too fast. I literally in one summer it was like it was, it was like the Incredible Hulk. I was like, whoa, what's going on? Here? And, I, and I was like a puppy. I'd whack people. I had no idea where these limbs were coming from. I'm so used to being short, but now I, I'm still thinking that I'm short. Still mm. goes on to this day. It keeps me in comedy. So in Philadelphia, were there comedy clubs? What, what, like, how did you get into comedy? Shift from that classroom. It's funny. Out? It's funny you should say. I, 
I don't get asked that very often, but I did not start in a comedy club now that I think of it. I started in, I was going to go to law school. I, uh, I started in high school and I worked at this law firm and they thought I was funny. All the people that worked there, the clerks and the lawyers, I played on the lawyer softball team. I'm like this, you know, young guy and just hanging out with all, you know, I hang, I've always hung out with different you know, status people, you know, whatever it is, class system yes. we're in, which I don't believe in. I believe we're all one. But I would hang out with everyone from the messengers and clerks all the way to the partners. And uh, I was always, you know, like a hustler. And, and I started doing impressions in the lunchroom of people that worked there and celebrity impressions. And a guy played guitar. He used to have these long fingernails, Jim Mardinley. And he said, why don't you go between sets of my band? and be a filler and it was uh, 108 degrees in humidity in Philadelphia in West Philadelphia Sandy Supper Club and it, it was three o'clock in the afternoon and I filled in the space between uh, the, the sets of the band and my six friends all African-American crowd completely and I'm not although I found out I'm 14 <laughs> percent I did I did 23 me I found out 14 percent little did I know back then I was there were my cousins you but, did one uh, of those ancestry I did that yeah I'm, I'm from Ghana apparently but <laughs> I had no idea I wish I would have known then I would have been a big hit at Sandy Supper Club but I I did impressions of um I did like Jimmy Carter and Nixon I mean these this is how far back it goes I was I did them uh, smoking pot because I, I figured I smoked a lot of pot back then. I might as well put it in my comedy. So it would be like Curly from the Three Stooges. You know, I don't know how that, I don't know how I don't do that act anymore. But uh, yeah, that was my first act with Celebrity Smoking Pot. And then I did Barney Fife. You probably don't know who he is. Don Knotts. Well, coming from England. Yeah, had you wouldn't different... know. The Andy Griffith show. Oh, yes. It was yes, a big had, show. Yes. He played Deputy Barney Fife. Yes. He was the first uh, first guy. I really, I did him so well that there's a movie Pleasantville, yes, and he yes. plays the TV repairman. He was sick, and I replaced him for like most of the movie. Is actually my voice dubbing him. Wow! They circle Apple on the telestrator. It's actually my voice going, "Boom! What do you call that right there, bud? The forbidden fruit here in Pleasantville. I'm your TV repairman." <laughs> <laughs> so you did a lot of voiceover a lot work of voiceover, as yeah. well. A Cartoons lot. and things like that. I never wanted to be me. And the irony is now I do. Now that it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> so going from that supper club, pleasant pleasant I mean obviously there's there's well, things a that long happen in between. Space in between I that. Mean, I did Ava Tamini's backyard was my first real comedy. <laughs> I did it for beer. Ava Tamini's backyard, she had a party in our neighborhood and uh, people put passed around a hat. And uh, what's odd about it though is people said, you have to have something to fall back on. And, you know, I went to yeah. college and graduated college and everything, but I always did comedy. Comedy put me through college. We were very uh, poor growing up. I used to think the word evict meant move. I thought they were the same word. I go, look, mommy, here's the eviction truck. And we would move, we'd move again. I still keep a box pack to this day. I can't get over it even though I've been making a living doing this, but they said something to fall back on. I'm still doing the same. I'm doing comedy for since high school. So and, after, uh, so, well, you left Philadelphia. Where did you then go next? And well, I tried New York, failed. It was very, very difficult. Uh, it was at a time New York was really filthy. I remember interviewing. When you say you felt like what what was I just didn't experience? really I didn't make the right moves. I moved to the wrong area. Then I tried to find another. Like you had to do roommates. I remember interviewing. This guy's going asking me if I you know leave my clothes around. I'm, and I wanted to say to him, "Do you pee in the corner? I mean, there's a real urine smell over here." Yeah. And I remember thinking, "That's my bottom. I got to get out of here." I went back to Philadelphia, did some TV back there, and then. And what then TV were you doing? In Philadelphia? I hosted uh, like I co-hosted. Something it was after Saturday Night Live. We hosted horror films with um, Wow. Was, uh, Saturday Night Dead was Stella, that man eater from Maniunk. and that was I would do the voices and all the characters on the show, and then and then I did this um, uh, Prism Network, not Prism. Yeah, almost went there too, but uh, <laughs> that's a whole other story. But the Prism Network, I would do these interstitial, like in between uh, their programming, I would do comedy. Uh, for them, you know, do like Jack Nicholson impressions. I do a lot of, I'll do oh, the full makeup Oh, let's hear Jack Nicholson. <clears throat> Somebody's gonna have to 
bribe me to do an impression like that. Ooh, I like it. <laughs> I haven't done impressions in so long. It's so strange to, to bring them back. So New York, back to Philadelphia. And then, and then out to LA. Uh, I was uh, prompted by, I auditioned for a, for a, a film and it was a big casting director. He really liked me. Uh, Dennis Erdman's his name. And uh, he became a big director as well. And he said, you should move to Los Angeles. And I moved out and I got a, I got a contract right away. It didn't go real well, <laughs> but, but I learned the lessons from the, there are a lot what of- What was the biggest lessons. lesson that you learned? Humility is, uh, this is a, I hope that someone hears this. You know, oh, that someone will to, hear it. That someone, that someone who needs to hear yes, it hears course. this message. And, and I see it now, it's like, you know, now that you have the older wisdom, you know, go, geez, if I could do that over again. But this is one of those things that maybe somebody doesn't have to do this. So I get this contract, NBC, Brandon Tartikoff, the owner of NBC, signs this new comedian, this 23-year-old comedian who moves to Los Angeles. And they, uh, so they give me a money. So you th start thinking, oh my God, I got I, I bought up. A car, a Lincoln Mark 7. I forgot I wasn't in South Philly anymore because <laughs> that's not a happening car in Los Angeles. And the big wheel well and everything. It's, it's, it's a pimp mobile. And I'm riding around. I bought a house, got a girlfriend, the whole deal. Like, I'm the NBC contract player. You, it reminds me of the character of Benny the Mailman in I'm Dying Up Here yeah. on Showtime, which I know you had uh, you had a show on Showtime as yeah, well. Yeah, it, so, anyway, so yeah. I, so I get this. And I got really high on myself, literally bragging. And I just thought, oh, this is it. I'm, I'm the MB I thought I was like a contract player, you know, like the old school from MGM contract. I'm with NBC. The first day I pull up in my new car to the guard gate and I said, uh, I'm here for my parking spot. Because I had this idea about a parking spot means you made it. I always see people's parking spot. Look who that, look, look, look over there is Wink Martin or whatever. So I, I pull up and a guy goes, what's your name? I said, Craig Shoemaker. I said, um, I'm the new NBC contract player. And he said, well, your name's not on the list. Well, perhaps they missed it because it's my first day. And he goes, yeah, go take a space next to Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney, like the old school. You know, we don't have contract players that have parking spots. This is what I thought. And that was the beginning of the tumble. Uh, what happened was I so I... They finally, I did get a test deal. It's called a test deal. You sign the contract. I'll make $15,000, $17,000 a week for minimum 13 weeks back then. That was a lot of 1989, money. 1989, that was a lot Ooh, of money. That's a lot. So I'm so excited, but I didn't study my lines because I'm going, hey, I got this in the bag. I'm the NBC contract player. I, I go into the office. There's only one other person I'm up against. And it has already picked up for 13 episodes. Mel Brooks, one of my idols, is the producer. Amazing. Chorus Leachman, the legend, is one of the stars. Harvey Corman. And I walked in. Uh, first of all, I didn't study. I walk. I was all cocky. I'm flirting with the receptionist. And they said, you're next. And I walked in, and suddenly something came over me. I was not prepared. And nerves took over. And that will happen if you are not ready for something, if you haven't uh, put the something into the process and I started shaking. I started shaking the, the, you could see my paper shaking. Now I start sweating and literally a plop of sweat landed on the paper. It like echoed through the room. The ink is now smearing of the magic marker that I put on there. Oh. And, I, and so I go, uh, can I curse on here? Yes. All right, because it has to do with the story. This is what really happened. So. And Mel Brooks is there. All these legends are looking. Brandon Tartikoff, the owner of the network. I'm going, <laughs> my voice is higher. And I, and then there's a phone call in the script. Instead of miming a call like most people would do, like you rehearse, which I didn't rehearse, I pick up an office phone. And I go, hello, Nuthouse. <laughs> and they go, I'm on the phone. I'm on the line. I don't have the presence of mind to switch lines. I go, I start reading my lines into the guy from some other office. I said, Mr. Nutt's not here. And I said, do you hear me? I'm on the line. Well, he's upstairs eating a Nutter Butter sandwich. Do you hear me? I'm on the line. Get off this line. I'm on an important call. This is all going through the phone. And I said, well, he loved Nutter Butter sandwiches. Mr. Nutt can't get enough of those. I'm shaking. The prince is smearing. And it, 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 this guy's screaming in my ear. And I'm pretending I don't hear him. They could all hear him. And finally he goes, I said, get the fuck off the fucking phone. Boom. Everyone hears it. I just hang the phone up. 
And I walked out with my tail between my legs. I had no presence of mind to say, can I do that again or anything? And that was the end. That was the end. That was the end of my contract, the girlfriend, <laughs> my house. <laughs> that was a bottom. Yes, yeah, so that there. was like, that's one of those moments. And I've had quite a few where when you think about, when you go to your goals too fast and you don't work on the being present, this is what, this is the results. These are the results of, that's why when we see someone on the cover of a magazine, you just go, I want to be on the cover of a magazine. We see somebody on a TV show. I want to be on a TV show. But, I mean, because yeah. you've, you, you're one of the top 100 comedians. Yeah. It took, you've been it, com it took the work, comedian though. Comedian of the year, and yeah. you've won two Emmys. Yeah, it take, but it so, takes that kind of work to do that. I mean, you have to what be present you do, for your so, work. So you say be present. Were there yeah. any other, were there a couple of, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of things. Were there a couple of other key things that you could just touch upon very briefly? Even Comedian of the Year was a humbling moment because um, I learned about awards. Awards are such an illusion. You know, it's just, it's not based on reality. It's just based on, in that moment, you happen to be popular. It's no different than, you know, high school being in a clique. You happen to be in the popular clique. And, you know, the country voted, which was really nice. And I really did want to win. But all it did, I thought, oh, this will be great for my career. I've never been recognized in the street. Weren't you the comedian of the year on ABC on American Comedy Awards? Never once has that happened. But what did happen was the comedians... All it did was heighten the resentment of other comedians. I became that guy. You, you become the target of like, what does he have? How does he win that award? Or he, whatever, however he got that award. And I realized at that moment, the same with Oscars, I hardly even watch anymore because it's so fake. It's fake. It's like, uh, it's, how about when they do the thank yous? Do you think anyone in America is entertained by who they thank? These just these names, they're doing it. By the way, when I did win, I did... I said, a lot of people have asked me to thank them. I said, I already know them. I'm going to thank the people I'd like to help me in my career. <laughs> so I said, I'd like to thank Stevie Spielberg, Marty Scorsese. I named, them, named the people. I said, those are the people that I need right now. And, uh, but it's true. I mean, it's So many people would ask me to thank them if you win this award. And that's what it's about. Everybody's ego. So ego is the killer. You know, ego's, ego's a, it's a career killer. It can make you, but even when you make it, I know all these celebrities. I know almost everyone I've met, almost every. There's so many unhappy people that got there. Which where leads they, to... Where they think there is. So Comedy comedy Kitchen, that is with celebrities and... Yeah. Well, the Comedy Kitchen's a great example of doing work that's organic to me, that really feels true. These are the places that I ended up in my life, not going for these you know, like I said, illusions or, or somebody else's idea of success. So I created a show based on working with my best friend, one of my best friends from Philadelphia, Tony Luke, who's a big restaurateur, big Italian guy. And we were very Philly, but, and we have this great brotherly relationship. And in real life, I train him how to be a comedian and he teaches me food. Ooh. So on the show, we have... That happens in the first episode, and then the other episodes, it's uh, we bring in famous comedians, and he trains them to do a dish for the judges, and I train the chefs how to be comedians. You know I've got the tougher job, by the way. <laughs> in a couple <laughs> yes. of weeks, doing stand-up, oh, people's yeah. number one fear is standing up in front oh, of people, yeah. let it's alone so add, uh, you have to make them laugh. So, uh, and food, you can't taste it from home. But the judges tasted the food, and uh, the episodes were great. With Bill Bellamy and Heather McDonald and Gina Neely from the Neelys on Food Network. It just, it was so, so much unique. fun. Well, it combines everything. And plus, we did it. My friend uh, Mike Davis, he has Davis Estates in Napa, which is ridiculous. It's the number one winery in Napa. And, it's like uh, a comedians and coffee is exactly. high school. This is but like this doing that. This is a, like doing the uh, mm -hmm. the MBA. <laughs> yeah, it takes it to a whole other level. And, and I mean, that's great. Yeah, and it just this sounds like really. Oh, we and we had so much fun. We had celebrity judges, and we had uh, this beautiful place. We went on ATV rides. He has 150 acres, so it became kind of lifestyles of the rich and famous combined with food and funny. Wow. I mean, that's a pretty good combination, and. Uh, it debuts, uh, we did four episodes on Jewish Life Television, 
we're incubating it there. I, we don't think it's going to have any great legs on there. We hope that Netflix picks, picks us up. It's a, oh, I'm sure. It's, it's I'm a sure great it's show. And we have, you know, I've, I've been at this a long time. Yeah. So I brought in my friends, I even want... to work on the show. The, the, the director did a movie that I wrote and starred in called Totally Baked and brought him in. He happens to be an all-star Academy chef. So he's the perfect person. It all lined up. My new book is actually called, you're the first to hear this, it's called Get Out of Line and Into Alignment. Ooh, get out of line and into alignment. I exactly. love it. And I'll have That's... you promote it because I like the way you put the... Into, <laughs> into alignment. Into... <laughs> yes. Yeah. And it really is... That's basically what I've learned is we're all in line from the get-go. We pledge of allegiance. You're pledging allegiance and you're all these, you know, step by step. You get awarded and rewarded for being in line and being doing things the way other people, the patriarchs, tell you to do it. What We're in alignment with our soul when we just get conscious and we become who we're supposed to be, not what they dictate us to be. And if we're in alignment with that, it's just, it's a, it's a home run every time. And this show was a reflection of that alignment because I'm co-hosting with one of my best friends. It's full trust. You're, yeah, you're it's, living, This is like me being back in my joy. fort in Philadelphia with my old buddies. This is like, and here we are doing this television show together and creating, you know, and in our alignment. Yeah. This leads me to my last question. I wish we had so much more time together, which is the legacy that you're creating. And I know you're doing it through Comedy Kitchen, through... Stand-up, still doing a lot yes, of stand-up. Yes, all, yeah. all of that. L the last thing that I would like you to touch upon is Laughter Heals. Sure. And what sparked that the mission of it and the, the legacy you're leaving. And if you can squeeze that into a minute. Sure. <laughs> well, uh, I had a ha-ha moment. I like to call it. I'm in comedy. A ha-ha moment. My, uh, I had all these people who would tell me that they conceived children after my show. So unless you want to conceive a child, don't, don't, when you're around me, don't have sex today for about three <laughs> days. Because I'm, uh, you know, f laughter really does work. It's a, truly a medicine that we don't give it enough a credit. It's a stressor, right? Exactly. And people are trying to have a child. They all had children after going to my show. So I was noticing how many people were telling me this. And we're doing the movie The Love Master after this character I do in Arizona. And Michael Goldberg, who's another comedy guy, wrote Cool Runnings, Little Giants. He says, my wife is ovulated. I said, do The Love Master. And baby Kayla was born nine months later. But then a year and a half after that, he got brain cancer. And they gave him three months to live. That's when I started Laughter Heals. We do workshops. We work in cancer facilities, wounded warriors. And you watch people transform through laughter. And he lived 15 years past that prognosis. Wow. From adding joy and laughter and a reason to live. That is beautiful. Yeah, laughterheals.org. And we're, we're at it. We're, we're going we're having workshops everywhere. And if anybody's interested, you know, contact us. Buy a t-shirt. Keep us yes, alive. <laughs> I love it. Laugh Thank is you. the best medicine. Just open up and say, ha, ha. Ha, ha. Ha, ha. <laughs> ha, ha. <laughs> Amazing. So my special guest today was Craig Shoemaker, founder of LaughterHeals.org, Comedian of the Year, Emmy winner, show Comedy Kitchen, all these incredible things that he's doing. Please, um, tune in and watch share with your friends i'm joanna garzilli you're watching life stories you can watch all the episodes at lifestoriestelevision.com and also download the ever talk tv app to watch the show thank you so much